I'm so glad to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. It's February. By now, you should have your W-2s, your 1099s, and your other tax documents. And when you think about filing taxes, so many different options. How do you decide when you're going to hire a CPA who does tax or an enrolled agent? Or when are you going to buy a software program? When do you use free file from the IRS? This is all uh, such a, a difficult jumble for us to decide. I'm going to give you some guidance on that. Also, in this episode, do you know what you're earning in your savings account? Most people have no clue. I want to make sure that you are maximizing what you can make on your money because we got out of the habit of this for the nine years that money and savings was earning basically nothing and now it's earning money again unless you leave it sitting behind. Okay, we got to talk. The IRS still has apparently more than 10 million returns from last tax year that they still haven't processed. And here we are in February in the next tax year. So people who filed last year for 21 millions still haven't had their returns processed. In fact, at one point, the end of last year, there were maybe more than 30 million unprocessed returns. You try to call the IRS, your chances of reaching an actual live human got about a 1 in 10 chance, maybe even after multiple phone calls. I mean, this is a mess. And, you know, there's been a lot of fuss about the money that the U.S. House wants to strike from the IRS's budget because they're uh, doing a targeted enforcement program with additional money that Congress allocated last year to go after tax cheats. But what about just taking care of regular taxpayers? Okay, how much of the money in the new allocation that Congress passed, according to the Wall Street Journal, all right, you're going to love this, 4% of the money is going to improve customer service at the IRS. Almost all the rest is for either updating computer systems or for the new enforcement effort going after tax cheats. So, we got to come up with a better way. You know, we are, with the way we handle income taxes, we are the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing year after year and expecting a different result. <coughs> Absolutely bonkers. Okay, so I want to share something with you from research done by Barron's. How many countries have gone to something I first talked about, gosh, I, I guess 10, 15 years ago, what's known as return-free filing. I mean, Krista, that was so long ago, and us working together on the then radio show. Right. I, I don't know, I was at 15, whatever <laughs> years ago, because... Country after country after country now has a system where you don't file a return anymore. You just get a refund or a bill with, with a detail of the explanation of why you got the refund. Looking at your, it's almost like a, a spreadsheet showing this was your income from this, this was your income from that, this was your income from the other thing. And this was the money you had withheld. And so we owe you X numbers of euros or whatever currency it is. 
or you owe us this much and please pay your bill. Sounds simple. Sounds simple. So simple that 36 countries now do this. I talked about it when it first started. And guess what? When did it start in the first country to offer return-free tax filing? What country is it? Well, first of all, it was the United Kingdom. Okay. And when did they start it? I wasn't even born yet. Oh, wow. It was that long ago. It was in the 19... 19- <laughs> Not that it's that long ago. <laughs> yes, it is. I mean, my kids really believe that I went to school dodging dinosaurs. I'm so old. That Just recent? See? Wow, that was very recent. <laughs> the dodging dinosaurs. So, I mean, think about that. The 1940s, England came up with this, or United Kingdom. And now country after country after country, but us. Okay, so here's the funniest thing. How much was allocated towards the uh, stuff required to implement return-free tax filing in the United States in that tax law passed last year? $15 million. Wow. So $80 billion for the IRS, of which $15 million was for going to return free. I mean, it is crazy. I mean, those of us like me own my own company, uh, companies, um, have all these investments all over the place and all that. I'm going to have to file a return. I'm going to have to do paperwork. In any of these other countries, I would have to do all the paperwork. I would have a CPA who does tax. And I'm getting to the first thing I said, how do you decide who you hire? So my situation is very complicated. There are those among us who have complicated tax situations. Most people don't. And it's beyond, it's beyond stupid. I mean, it's just stupid that here we are in 23 and we're still filling out these idiotic tax forms. Because I would say 80 plus percent of people could do return free. And, and I know there are people in the United States who worry that the government would cheat us on calculating our tax. But that's why the documentation provided back to you with your refund or your tax bill is key. And so these systems are trustworthy. And they're a lot easier to understand these statements you get than our crazy, bizarre tax forms we have in the United States. So that's my hope, is that we will adopt something modern instead of doing this bonkers thing we do with all the paperwork for most people. But going to the core of how you decide who to hire. If you have a complicated situation, you have a lot of investments, uh, you have things going on in your life that involve a lot of additional schedules. You give a great deal of money to charity, a variety of things. You would benefit potentially from tax planning. The most overlooked thing by business owners and more affluent people are moves you can make in a current tax year that will save you money when you file your taxes the following year. I can tell you every enrolled agent, which is another category other than uh, CPAs who do tax, every enrolled agent, every CPA who does tax will tell you that they wish their clients would talk to them about things going on in their lives when they're going on instead of when it's time to start getting the stuff together for doing their taxes the following year. Most taxpayers will do just fine with the free file program of the IRS that almost nobody uses. Where you go to irs.gov, you click on free file, you see which software programs you can use from traditional outside companies to prepare and file your taxes. Your federal's free if you live in a state with a state income tax. 
you may or may not have to pay, depending on the provider you go with, for preparing your state tax return for you if your state has one. And so the people who need professional help are people with complexity. If you don't have complexity, you're fine almost always with the free file software that is good for most income earners. Beyond that, you can buy tax software, and it's not expensive to prepare your return. Krista? Okay, Scott and Will Texas. I still be alive by the time we have Absolutely. The, Stop um, it. Don't no, I'm serious. That. I mean, if, if this is something countries have been doing since right after World War II, and we still haven't done it in the United States, is it going to happen in my lifetime? Maybe I should be the IRS commissioner. Maybe you should. People say you, you should run for president. I just got oh, another email yeah. saying that. President of what? <laughs> All right, we'll go to Scott in Texas has a question about taxes, actually. I recently sold some oil stock and made a net gain of over $60,000. Congratulations. A few years back, I had a similar gain, and at tax time, I was penalized by the IRS for not sending in a check for estimated taxes when I sold the stock to cover the gain I made, even though I paid taxes on it at tax time. Per the tax laws, do I need to send in a check to cover the profit I made? Yeah, so Scott, what, what we're talking about is ES, estimated payments. And if you have lots of alternative income that puts you into a higher tax bracket, you are required to pay in estimates four times a year, or you have to have safe harbor. There are certain safe harbor provisions, and in your situation, you absolutely want a CPA who does tax or an enrolled agent to sit down with you go over your overall income situation and determine if you should make estimated payments and they will be able to calculate for you how much those estimates should be because underpayment of tax leads to penalties, under underpayment over the course of a year. Now, Scott, if you work, though, at a regular job, there's a trick of the trade around having to pay estimates. And what you can do is with your employer in the back half of the year of 23, I'm assuming you sold the stock here in 23, you can adjust your withholdings of federal taxes and bump them way up to cover the anticipated tax you'll owe on the capital gains of the 60000 And then you will owe no penalty because withholding from a paycheck is treated as if it happened in equal amounts all through a year and is a safe harbor from underpayment of estimated taxes over the course of a year. Now, that's the kind of thing, sitting down with an enrolled agent or a CPA who does tax, that they would go to right away is a way for you to avoid estimated taxes and avoid underpayment penalties. Lorian, Wisconsin says, Clark, a year ago, my husband retired and we switched from non-actively managed accounts to having an active manager and paying the higher fees. It seems we lost just as much money. Is it necessary to have an active manager in retirement more than in the years before retirement? Should we just go back to Fidelity index funds? So the either or you pose to me, Lori, I, I would like to take that a different direction. So having uh, advice from someone is not about picking funds or allocating. I mean, a computer model can do that based on your age, your assets, what other sources of income you have, like Social Security, whether you have a pension, anything like that. Uh, the modeling can do that. What the financial person is for is a much bigger picture. Are you on target for your goals? How much is a safe amount of money for you to withdraw from your accounts? What is your plan in the event one or the other of you passes away? Is your will properly accounting for that? Do you have all the key things in place for in the event uh, both of you were to pass away in an accident or whatever in, at the same period of time? Do you have the proper plans in place for what would be inherited by a next generation? What a financial planner is for is, as you pointed out correctly, it's not at all about picking that asset allocation. 
It is about the much bigger picture of your goals, needs, and wants in this next phase of your life. If you're hiring, if you hired somebody who is not a fiduciary, who is somebody who lives by commissions and fees, then that's not what you're getting. And your performance over time will actually be inferior to what you would have doing what you're thinking about just doing fidelity index funds or something like that. So the core is hiring the right kind of individual. And if you want to look at the steps to hiring the right person, we have info at Clark.com how to go through that process of vetting somebody and hiring the right person for you and your husband's situation. And I hope retirement is outstanding for both of you. And from Art in Wyoming, Clark, you tell us day in and day out how important it is to save in 401k and Roth accounts, but you've never explained how we will be able to use or withdraw money to use in retirement. Are we allowed to withdraw funds at will, like a checking account, or are we obligated to establish a withdrawal schedule? And if so, can it be modified depending on variations in purchase spending? By the way, I plan to start using my nest egg at the earliest date possible, age 59 and a half. Thanks, Clark. You're the best. Wow. Okay. So uh, thank you and congratulations to you that you've been saving money. It's such a rapid clip that you're going to be financially independent and be able to bag work in your 50s. And I've found that when I do uh, what we call in television, uh, man on the street interviews, which could be man, woman, whatever, and we just ask people questions, consistently the answer I hear from people on when they would like to retire is in their 50s. In order to be able to do that, you got to do like you've done and save boatloads of money. So the answer to your question is there are no requirements once you reach eligible age to withdraw from retirement accounts, how much or how little you withdraw in a year until you, at your age, under the new law, till you're 75 years old. And then you have to do it based on life expectancy from 75 years old on. And so you can pull out as tiny amounts, large amounts, and in between. The thing, though, that's important is not what the government requires, it's what long life requires, that you make sure that you don't spend too much money in your 60s, that when you live in your 70s, 80s, 90s, and beyond, that you are prepared for that by having enough money still on hand. When you hit that retirement point, it would be great for you to do a checkup with a fee-only financial planner who would charge you a fee to look at what you've got, work on your plan with you, and come up with that next phase of life plan for you so that you don't outlive your money. Coming up next, speaking of money, there was an item in the Wall Street Journal about how Americans are making these enormous charitable gifts to the nation's big banks. By letting the big banks hold so much of their money, earning essentially nothing on it. Now I ask you, we the American people are very charitable, but should you be making charitable donations, giving money from your wallet that you worked hard all your life to earn, to then give it as a donation to the giant monster mega banks, you know my answer on it. So what do you do instead that's coming up next? You are probably so tired of hearing me talk about the giant monster mega banks, but they account for half a banking in the United States. And people put in turn that percent of total savings that Americans have in banks are in the four giant monster megas plus the fifth wannabe, which are Bank of America, Citibank, Chase, Wells Fargo, and U.S. Bank. U.S. Bank is the up-and-comer that's been buying all these others, and they're trying to be part of the awful giant monster mega banks. 
So calculation, this is crazy, all right? Americans in just 90 days lost collectively $42 billion in interest they would have earned taking their money from these five giant monster mega banks. You don't even have to if you've got your checking account there and you want to uh, suffer bank abuse and have your checking account with one of these five, go ahead. But pull your savings out because the amount we have lost collectively, $42 billion just in 90 days in interest we would have earned if we took our savings and money market and CDs and all that and moved the money from these behemoths to online banks and credit unions because the interest you would earn is so high with those, relatively speaking, and so puny, pitiful, terrible with this gang of five. See, I get to add Bank of America now and call them the gang of five. The gang of five giant monster mega banks. Now, I was just talking the other day about how much money you can earn in CDs with online banks. I didn't even pick on the gang of five with that. But the reality is you'll earn 20 times more in interest typically and could be higher than 20 times more with an online savings account or a credit union than you'll earn on your savings at one of the gang of five giant monster mega banks. It is your money. It is your financial security. It is your future. And you may be all tied into the web of that giant monster mega bank that they have trapped you psychologically in their terrible, nasty orbit. So what you do, open an account with a credit union or an online bank. And if you go to bankrate.com, it's a good place for you to see the best rates being paid, what, what institutions are paying the best rates on savings accounts, on CDs, whatever. And you'll be stunned if you actually look, because almost nobody knows how little interest they're getting from the giant monster mega banks. A lot of their accounts are paying one one hundredth of one percent, believe it or not, on your savings. So you just open an account elsewhere and you link it to your account at one of the gang of five. And then you move the money that you don't need currently to live on that can go in savings or CDs or money market accounts. And you earn so much more money. And then when you need it, two days notice, you can transfer it in at no cost back into the gang of five. And maybe you'll learn once your money's somewhere else that you are building up in savings or CDs or money markets, hey, I can open a checking account with these people and I don't pay anything for it. And maybe they'll pay me interest on my checking account. And step by step, you'll move away from the gang of five and understand why banks today have such a small percent of household money. Overall household money in the hands of banks now is down to, I think it's less than 10% of people's total assets now because ultimately people flow their money to the best lowest cost providers which is typically going to be discount brokers who are becoming you talk about giant monster mega you look at the sizes of fidelity investments vanguard and charles schwab and those three are so different culturally than the gang of five giant monster mega banks, where those three gain their market share and size from offering better deals than other people, where the giant monster mega banks do it just with, we're big, we're powerful, we're important, so you should be with us. Not a very good reason to be with them. Krista, All when right. do you think I'm going to be like... The American Bankers Association, they're going to make me person. Here. Yeah, well, I'll know something's gone wrong if you start singing their praises. Okay, this is from Jason in Colorado. Your recent episode on balance transfers was timely. My wife and I listened together, and it helped us not only to be motivated, but to take action in the new year to get out of our credit card debt spiral. 
We are opening a second card for the first time ever to transfer a sizable balance with a little over 11K. The card we chose from your list includes a perk of cell phone coverage. My question, do we start making our cell phone payments to this new card to take advantage of the perk? I plan to follow your strict advice of not using this card for new purchases until we can pay it off in full. Thanks for helping us take control of our situation. Yeah, so first of all, I'm glad that we're going to be able to save you a lot of interest cost by doing balance transfer. And so we work hard to have that list up to date as often as we can so you can see the best players out there for you strategically to do a balance transfer to work off your balances. So the way balance transfer offers operate, and, you, and I think you said it in what you said, you cannot charge anything to that card at all until you have paid off your balance transfer, or what happens is really not good because you have an outstanding balance on it. If you were to charge your cell phone bill to it, then that bill would then be at the prevailing interest rate on that card, which could be you know, 18%, 19%, 22%, 17%, whatever. And the payments you make uh, don't go to that. They go against the zero interest or low interest balance transfer. So you use that card only as basically a loan platform paying the loan of what you transferred to it and then once you have paid off that 11000 then you have green light to use that card for new purchases. So even though there's a cell phone perk where I assume... You pass is... on the cell phone perk right. for now because the cost that you're going to have to pay makes it not worth it. Uh, this is from Kent in Ohio. My eight-year-old daughter would like to sell eggs from our chickens. She also wants to sell things she has sewn with her new sewing machine on Etsy. I would love for her to generate earnings. Wait, 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 wait. I know. Eight-year-old kid <laughs> knows how to use a sewing machine or a sewing by hand? Sewing machine. Sewing machine? Yeah. She's crafty. I would love for her to generate earned wow. income from the sale of these goods so that she may invest the proceeds into a Roth IRA. Would it make more sense for me as her father to form an LLC and pay her as an employee, or should she have her own LLC in her name? Uh, actually, Kent, you don't have to do either of those things. All you have to do is keep a record of her income and whatever expenses she has, and she keeps good records of that, and then she's eligible to do a Roth IRA with her net earnings up to the maximum amount of her earnings in a year. She will not, uh, until she's earning a huge amount of money, she won't even have to file a tax return in order to do that Roth IRA. But the records documenting the earned income will need to be kept uh, for for a good long time because there's a presumption that when a minor child is funding a Roth IRA and does not have a traditional W-2 that uh, the family's playing games. So that's why you keep the records each year of what she has actually generated in income and then she's good to go with that Roth IRA. And we were talking about Fidelity Investments earlier. Fidelity you need $1 to open a Roth IRA, and Fidelity is the most friendly of all financial houses to a minor child having an investment account and a retirement account. And from Eric in Ohio, it is legal in Ohio where I live to gamble on sports. Is there anything I need to know about claiming winnings and reporting on my taxes that may not be common knowledge? I know you have to pay taxes on your winnings, but I wasn't sure if there was anything else. Oh, Eric, there's a lot involved with gambling winnings. The key is to keep solid records. I mean, we're talking about keeping records of making money from eggs and from sewing. In your case, it's all the gambling you do, every transaction you do, because every losing bet you place offsets against the earnings you have from a winning bet. So what happens is a lot of people don't keep good records of their gambling activity. And so they end up not getting the benefit 
of the bets that lost and having to pay full tax on the bet that paid off. So there are lots of, uh, if you go on YouTube, you'll see a ton of videos from CPAs who do tax about how to keep proper records of your gambling if you are doing it as a side thing or a profession. And so you asked, is there anything you should be doing? Yes. And the good records you keep will save you, if you end up being a very successful gambler, those good records you keep will save you so much money at tax time. And you just got to know that I, I, was in a, I was in a convenience store one day, and a guy was there who was a retired Army sergeant. And uh, I talk to everybody, as yep. you know. <laughs> and so he opens up this uh, briefcase kind of thing. And there's like a million lottery tickets in there. Not literally a million, but I mean, this huge thing, lottery tickets. And I said, uh, can you, do you mind telling me what this all is? And he says, oh, well, these are my losing tickets. And these are my winning tickets. So when, I come, when it comes time to do my taxes, I have to have both of these or I have to pay too much tax. And so he had his system. There was just this big briefcase portfolio kind of thing. And I was shocked how much he gambles. And so he was buying all these different, um, I don't know anything about how these state lottery things work, but he was buying the, the big game stuff and the Powerball stuff. And then he was buying all these local game tickets that I didn't know what they were. And so we're sitting there and he's explaining them all to me. And it was like going right over my head. I mean, it's pretty involved. So if you're going to do it as like a thing, you've got to make sure that you have the solid records. And if you're doing it in casinos, casinos are going to rat you out to the IRS on your winnings if you win big winnings. And so that's why it's so important for you to, what would you say? Just crack in, but rat you out. They're going to report your winnings. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so they're going to report you. And so that's why you've got to keep good records when you lose in the casino so that when you win, that's going to end up being reported and you need those losses to offset. Now, you sound super excited about all of this. Are you planning on starting to be a gambler? I did place a bet what? with a friend on a college football game at my usual ceiling amount. Oh, I know. Do you know what that is? One dollar. No, I wouldn't spend a dollar. Oh, I thought it was a dollar. I bet a dollar with you just because it's you and me. And one of us owes the other a dollar for something right now. I don't remember what it was. I'm sure you owe But anyway, me. this is what I have as my ceiling Quarter. for gambling. Wow. And so I lost a bet recently for a quarter. And so I have my quarter and my little Aldi holder. You do. So <laughs> as you see, so when I go to Aldi, you have to pay a quarter deposit to get a shopping cart. And I got there and I didn't have a quarter. I've now replenished my quarter from losing that bet. And so I'm in Aldi and I go around and I find a box. You know how everything's in the boxes. Find a box that was empty. And I'm carrying around everything in this box. And then I had to walk home from the Aldi carrying this box. I mean, I just, I was not together on that shopping trip. Because I simply, I had not replenished my quarter. You're just upset that you lost money gambling, which you don't normally well, you know, think is I a good idea at all. Well, you know, I figure a quarter isn't really gambling. I know problems can start from anywhere. Sure. <laughs> but that is my ceiling okay. on a bet. Except for with you. Where I'll bet the dollar. All right. All right. Well, <laughs> if you are a gambler and you think I should have more fun in my life and I'd have fun gambling, that's not true because one time Krista uh, called me and we were talking and I was at the CES in Las Vegas, which I did not go to this year, but I've been to over and over and over again, the Consumer Electronics Show. And you told me to go find 
a machine called the Tabasco. Mm -hmm. I remember this like it just happened. And you said, I want you to bet $20 in that machine. And if you've heard this story before, I apologize. So I bet your $20 in the Tabasco thing. And I don't remember, was it poker or, or I don't know. slot it's, machine? It's a slot machine, yeah. And so I, I lose all $20. And it was your money I was losing. I was in the worst mood for at least the next hour. I was so upset that I wasted that money. The so. house always has the advantage. Yeah. And sometime I'll have to tell you why I voluntarily would gamble a dollar at CES every day at Tropicana, but it had to do with getting free parking. But that's for another day. <laughs> Just tell it real quick. I mean... <laughs> so the deal was uh, you could only do free parking. Free parking's gotten much harder in Las Vegas, and at CES parking is so elevated in cost. So... I would pull in the Tropicana garage every day, and I'd go in, and I'd uh, buy my dollar of, you know, I'd do the dollar in the machine, and then I'd have my ticket that got me the free parking at the casino every day, and so I saved our company $120 on parking by gambling a dollar each of the six days. Brilliant. But I was gambling. I mean, it was gambling. And of course, I always lost the dollar. And I get really upset when I when, would win because I mean, I had to spend more time hitting the button till I lost the dollar. You couldn't have just cashed out and you still had your receipt? I didn't really understand how that worked. Oh. So I just lost my dollar six times. Okay. It is true. I really do stupid things like that. And thank you so much for joining us today. If you haven't already, please subscribe, like, and share us on YouTube or wherever you watch or listen. Have a great one.